Hey bug nerds, welcome back. I wanted to talk about this article that was recently published in Environmental Entomology. Uh, there was kind of a write-up about it on Entomology Today, which is ESA's uh, kind of journalist outlet. outlet. Uh, but the journal article itself is from the October edition of EnviroEnt, um, and it's called The Establishment and Potential Spread of Osmia Cornuta in North America. This comes from Oregon State University by Michael Getz and Friends. Uh, and I wanted to talk about it because it's a it's an interesting piece uh, for maybe unintended reasons. I have opinions. The just right off the bat, the actual research itself is fine. It's it's sound. It was well done. Um, I don't have opinions about these people's work per se. Uh, their work is good, um, but I do have how this applies to broader entomology is what I wanted to get into. But the article itself, uh, let's go through it. Um, so it's titled The Establishment of Osmia Cornuta in North America, so you can obviously guess what this is about, but Osmia Cornuta is a type of me uh, megachilid, so this is a leaf-cutting bee that is originally from Europe, and it was detected a couple years ago in British Columbia, Canada, uh, which is on the Pacific coast, and it seems to be established there now, and that this paper is confirming the establishment and then they wanted to do some environmental mod modeling to figure out how much it could spread in North America. And then also uh, there was a machine learning aspect to see if um, they could get a program to differentiate between this species and other species of megachilids in North America uh, in cocoon sorting for economic purposes. So this new invasive bee, Osmia cornuta, this is a mason bee or an orchard bee. Um, and they build nests in tubular spaces, naturally occurring tubular spaces, or other burrows from other insects, things like that. And then they fill them with mud or plant tissue, and they turn it into chambers for uh, reproduction. Um, and these are solitary bees, so they don't form colonies per se, uh, but they do, some, they do frequently... Um, they're frequently found around each other, stuff like that. So they're not truly social, but a lot of these bees will kind of nest in the same area. Two Osmia species, Osmia taurus and Osmia cornifrons, have already been introduced to North America. Uh, cornifrons was introduced intentionally on the East Coast in Maryland, and Osmia taurus was accidentally introduced. And now they're both uh, pretty well established on the eastern half of the United States. Osmia bees are uh, really good pollinators. They are frequently relied on to pollinate orchard, uh, fruit orchard systems, stuff like that, uh, specifically things like apples and pears. Um, and they're really, really good pollinators. So they're, they do have some economic benefit for humans, which is why Osmia cornifrons was intentionally introduced. Uh, and they are bred commercially. They're shipped around the country uh, or around the continent um, to fruit growers and other uh, agriculturalists who need pollinators. And these are kind of nice because you don't have to move hives like you do with honeybees. They don't really sting people. They don't really attack people. Um, they kind of just mind their own business and they go about reproduction. They reproduce multiple times a year. Um, you know, they're, they're overall pretty good pollinators. Uh, using the climate modeling in this paper, which they get into uh, about halfway through, um, they they believe these researchers believe that the bee itself could establish uh, become established across much of the eastern United States and a little bit in the warmer regions of the Pacific Northwest. So uh, there is a certain worry that they put forward that this could spread uncontrolled through uh, the majority of the United States. The article emphasizes the importance of monitoring and managing non-native pollinators, uh, and this is to protect native pollinators. Uh, it recommends improving detection and identification methods, getting kind of the public involved uh, for monitoring for bees, because there are a lot of conservation groups that do look at native pollinators. Uh, you have stuff like iNaturalist that can be a repository for information. And this can be really valuable for tracking invasive species, especially for pollinators, uh, because they feel like they need more accurate data. And this is kind of where we get into my opinions on the subject. So up to this point, I will say um, 
the research is all great. It's I have no objections to any of it, really. Uh, they did try to, like I said, establish a, a machine learning protocol that could figure out the cocoons of the different Osmia species. So in the Pacific Northwest, uh, other Osmia species are bred for pollination purposes. And what has happened, and they go into this in the article, is that um, a local Osmia breeder started seeing a different bee in uh, in and around his uh, other Osmia. And it was this red Osmia, which is uh, the Osmia uh, cornuta. And this was the first validated record. And he found that there were a bunch of these new Osmia cornuta uh, infesting his bee farm. Uh, and so now the issue is, well, can you separate them out? Because what happens is... Uh, the cocoons of these Osmia are shipped. Uh, that is the life stage that is shipped to agriculturalists and orchard owners and stuff like that so that they can establish populations in their uh, orchards or on their property. But if the cocoons are cross-contaminated, then you're shipping this, uh, this accidental Osmia introduction around uh, North America. So they couldn't get uh, a machine learning system to successfully separate these cocoons because there's quite a bit of overlap in the physical uh, dimensions of the cocoons. Uh, so the, the various measurements that they took um, were not distinct enough amongst the species to successfully uh, separate them. So now you have this risk of contamination. So generally speaking, going back to this infestation of Osmia cornuta, and infestations of other invasive insects. Invasive insects and many other invasive species generally take five to 10 years to be detectable. Uh, so they will have entered into an area and they will go unchallenged for five to 10 years by humans. And the reason for that is no one really notices until the species reaches a crit some critical threshold where it becomes obvious that they're in the environment. Um, unless you have people like specifically watching a certain area looking for this one thing for when it shows up. Um, if, if you're just talking about people going about their regular lives, how long does it take before someone notices that there's something different here, something's wrong? It can take five to 10 years, generally. In the case of this Osmia cornuta, it was eventually noticed in 2023 uh, at this commercial Mason bee farm. We don't actually know when it was introduced and how long it had been there. It could have been there for years. Uh, it most likely had been there for quite some time, uh, at least a couple years, at lower level populations before this uh, Mason bee breeder realized, oh, there's another species mixed in with the ones that I'm breeding. So uh, we don't know how long it was there, and we don't know necessarily where it came from. Was some, some stock that he brought in contaminated? Uh, did it get introduced from the outside environment? Uh, so we don't know if it was already in a broader area. There's a lot of unknowns here about how long it had been around. Based on this study, Osmia cornuta cocoons uh, are indistinguishable from the other mason bees that uh, these uh, this breeder had and what the other bees that these researchers were looking at. So it is entirely likely that this species has already been sh shipped out from this breeder to multiple other locations uh, inside both the U.S. and Canada. And we don't know necessarily where it has been shipped to because we don't know how long it's been there and all this other stuff. On top of that, uh, Osmia is a, tri it's a tricky, sp tricky species to control uh, because of some of their nesting activities. And I'll quote the article here. Osmia species have several attributes that contribute to their wide distributions. As a cavity nester, they can disperse globally by building nests in materials used for international shipping. Osmia species are gener generally polylectic, which support flexible adaptations to new environments. Although some species have known floral preferences such as Osmia ribiflorus. Uh, Exotic Osmia can benefit from commercial beekeeping operations, which provide housing, food, and further opportunities for anthropogenic dispersal. Furthermore, the shipment of cocoons, either by large commercial operators or by small-scale hobbyists, 
may accelerate the inadvertent dispersal of Osmia species. Although some states regulate the import of non-native insects, there are currently no federal limits on domestic shipments of Osmia species within the continental United States or Canada. So, what I take from that is, any restrictions that you know you were thinking about for preventing the spread of this bee have likely already failed before they've even been put into into use this bee has likely spread pretty far on top of that what we can tell from the other osmia species that were intentionally introduced into the east coast uh, they will spread pretty uncontrollably so that's you know the cat's out of the bag with that one so talking about controlling this because of problems uh, that it causes for native uh, pollinators, especially native osmia uh, or native uh, omega killids, is this is a, a pointless conversation to be had because you're not going to actually do anything meaningful uh, with attempting attempting to control the spread. Additionally to this, you are not going to get widespread public support for the control or eradication of a bee especially a bee, which isn't pestilent. Osmia don't attack people, um, and they don't attack, they don't really attack animals. They don't really do anything to bother people. Uh, so people aren't going to be up in arms about this invasive species like they are about other things like uh, spotted lanternfly or brown marmorated stink bug or any of these other things. Arguments that the bees will, that these Osmia bees will reduce local populations of native solitary bees through competition or the transmission of pathogens, specifically fungal pathogens and viruses, from geographically distinct areas are probably correct, if not absolutely true. But these arguments are completely impotent. The general public aren't going to get behind the destruction of cute pollinators from this argument. They're just not going to do it. These same arguments apply to common honeybees, which are not native to North America, they're European in origin, and many European bumblebees, which have been introduced for pollination purposes. People like pollinators. People like bees. They're not going to support widespread efforts, efforts for the eradication of any of these species, or even the control of any of these species. So these arguments are just not compelling for the public. While the spread of the mason bee is destructive to insect biodiversity, it is likely that the economic benefits of these uh, in the long term are going to be impossible to prevent the spread or control it at all. There are economic incentives to spread this bee. It's a good pollinator. It's a cheap pollinator. Uh, it's an annoying contaminant for these mason bee operations as is that they can't really sort out so they're not going to invest millions of dollars into doing this um they're not pestilent like there's just a lot of reasons to keep it around and arguing that it's just uh bad for the other bees is not going to carry much water the entomology community should get off of this invasive pollinator train this argument because it's kind of a waste of time and resources as Arguments for, for preservation of insect biodiversity are, at best, incredibly niche. I understand it. That doesn't make it a good argument. If entomologists are concerned about native osmia species or other native solitary bees, they should push for less funding for this sort of preventative research and more funding for research towards the control of pathogens of bees and better ways to boost native bee fitness uh like nest like research into nesting sites uh that privilege native species over invasive species stuff like that and there's a lot of work to be done with stuff like that but this sort of um we must stop it at all cost oh my god it's going to affect biodiversity no one cares and they are true statements but that doesn't mean it's going to work like that's just the way it is um, so those are my opinions. It's good research. Uh, they're absolutely adorable bees. And that's part of the problem. They're absolutely adorable bees. You're not going to get people to <laughs> willingly start like controlling for this species. It doesn't cause any harm to them. It's not stinging them. And it's cute. 
like you're it's just a it's a losing argument so really good paper nice job you guys uh i'll put the authors up again uh michael getz lincoln best anthony melithopolis and timothy warren out of oregon state university it's cool that you've been able to confirm that this is uh an invasive species uh cool modeling it's just uh, the uh, the final argument for control isn't i don't think it's going to carry much water so i'll talk to you guys later i'll put links to uh this paper i believe it's open access through esa right now um it's not a very long read i'll also link to the entomology today article which is honestly about as long as this article anyway so uh go ahead and check those out and i'll talk to you guys later